Good morning, welcome to C3 Grow. So great to have you with us today. And this morning we are continuing our journey towards Easter with this great theme, Ransomed. In this series, we are examining and celebrating the paradoxical truth that, as Jesus himself says in Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And we are looking at the essentiality of receiving Jesus as a servant if we are to receive him as Savior. I want to invite you to come with me to Matthew's Gospel this morning. It's the very first book of the New Testament, and we're going to be looking at Matthew 16, verses 21 to 23 to begin. Matthew 16, verses 21 to 23. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. There's a beautiful passage in the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, it tells of a great invitation which is offered to all through the gospel. It's an invitation to come to God. And in verses 6 and 7 of Isaiah 55, it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. And then God says this through the prophet Isaiah, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. There's a well-known proverb which says much the same thing. Proverbs 14, 12, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. In today's passage, Jesus, with jarring force and blunt exclamation, sets the things and the thoughts of God over against the things and the thoughts of people. He says that the things of people and the thoughts of people are one thing, but the things of God and the thoughts of God are quite another thing altogether. And for this reason, we often stand a very good chance of completely missing the point of what he's saying or doing. The disciples certainly missed the point of what Jesus was actually saying or doing a whole lot, and not for lack of trying, despite their unique and privileged vantage point to see Jesus live, to see Jesus work, to hear Jesus teach so up close, yet they still often completely missed the point. How? Why? Because the heavens are higher than the earth, and so too his ways were higher than their ways, and his thoughts were higher than their thoughts. Now here in our passage today, Peter, in his own human wisdom, thought that he needed to correct Jesus Christ. The text says that he began to rebuke him. Now that's audacious, isn't it? After all, Peter had just rightly confessed, verse 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He knew who Jesus was. Will a man rebuke God? Yes, Peter did. And so do we. Even if not allowed like Peter on this day, we can go to God as if to correct him when we see things happening that we don't think fits the way things ought to be. But that's largely because we don't always set our minds 
on the things of God. We too mostly set our minds on the things of men. Peter had an idea as to how the Messiah would take his rightful place, but his idea did not involve the Messiah suffering, and it certainly did not involve the Messiah being killed. So when Jesus said that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, Peter steps in and he begins to rebuke Jesus. Now, what was it that offended Peter and the disciples' paradigm so much? They understood well enough that Jesus was, in fact, the long-awaited Messiah. No offense taken there. They understood well enough, verse 18, that he was going to build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. So no offense taken there. Nothing up to this point had provoked any sort of shock or offense from Peter or the other disciples. But what they couldn't accommodate was that the Messiah was going to suffer. They could not reconcile that the Messiah was going to die. Humiliation, rejection, hostility, and death was really not within the framework of their messianic viewpoint. So you can pinpoint the offense. The disciples were Jewish boys. They were raised with a Jewish worldview. They uh, lived their lives with Jewish ways and thoughts. Uh, interestingly, Paul speaks about the gospel this way in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 23. He says, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews. Now that there is really helpful to understand why Peter missed the point of what Jesus was saying and doing in our text. The Christ crucified, the Christ suffering, the Christ murdered. Peter pushes back. I have no room for a humiliated Messiah. It cannot be. Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But Jesus says, he must. The Lord must. Do you see that word there in verse 21? From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and he must be killed. He must. You cannot possibly read too much weight into that word. This is a divine imperative. This is a divine necessity. This is why he came. This is the plan of God set in motion before the foundation of the world. And you don't want to set yourself up in opposition to this kind of must. But that's what Peter did, or at least that's what he tried to do. So let's just take a, a quick look at God's offensive plan. It was offensive in the sense that it was a strategic attack that would bring about the spectacular defeat of Satan, sin, and death. And it was also offensive in the sense that it offended the sensibilities of Peter and the other disciples. We're going to see it looking at verse 21. First, Jesus must go to Jerusalem. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. So Jesus didn't just happen to find himself in Jerusalem, accidentally caught up in a murder conspiracy. There's this great phrase in Luke 9 51, which we're going to be looking at in a fortnight time uh, on Palm Sunday. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus had to go to Jerusalem to be the Passover lamb. He had to die his death for sin on a hill in Jerusalem. And so he set his face to go there. He must go there. He was there as an expression of divine will, divine freedom, and divine determination. So Jesus must go to Jerusalem. Second, Jesus must suffer. And again, this is where it starts to get really difficult for Peter and the boys. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. So Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, he is going to Jerusalem 
to subject himself into the hands of the corrupt religious leaders of a broken religious system. And you can see why Peter was struggling to get on board with this plan. But it only gets worse because here comes the hammer blow. Not only is he going to suffer, he must be killed. He must be murdered, unjustly murdered. This is really jarring stuff here. It's really blunt. It's shocking. Jesus had already alluded to this in veiled and guarded ways, so perhaps it shouldn't have come as such a shock to the disciples. But the truth is, they just couldn't see it. It just could not be reconciled within their messianic viewpoint. So here in verse 21, an offensive plan is laid out. Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed. Now, if we take these words as Jesus is speaking them, and we just stop at this point, you can picture the disciples really reeling from this. But then Jesus adds one last crucial detail. Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Now that last detail turns the whole plan on its head. But I think the disciples missed it. I mean, can you blame them? Now, uh, we could probably go in one of two directions here. We can focus in on the resurrection, or we can follow Peter's experience and his train of thought. Today, we're going to do the latter. And on Easter Sunday, we will do the former. We will focus in on the resurrection. Now, we may not see as many visitors come to church this Easter as we normally might. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. But when life is more normal, there are many of our neighbors who will come to church happily enough a couple of times a year, Christmas and Easter. And I'm not mad at that. Let's view that as an opportunity that we ought to seek to make the most of. When these people who are deeply loved by God come to a Good Friday service, I just want to grab them and beg them, please, please make sure you come to Resurrection Sunday. Otherwise, they might walk away with an incomplete understanding of the plan. They might walk away with verse 21 minus that last crucial detail. They might think that Christianity is about a dying and dead Messiah. And I think that's where Peter was. Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed. And Peter couldn't hear anything else that Jesus was saying after that point. Peter could not comprehend this plan a suffering, dying Messiah. So while Jesus was saying he would be raised, Peter was in his own head forming the words for his rebuke. And he spat out, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And it sounds like the right thing to say, doesn't it? But again, there's a problem. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Peter. Neither are your ways my ways, Peter declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Peter had the power and glory, triumph and majesty, messianic view. The resurrected Jesus, but without any of the suffering, any of the humiliation, any of the pain, or in any of the death. A kingdom without a cross. It was a way that seemed right to Peter, but its end would be the way to death. Jesus had the suffering, pain, be killed, and then rise from the dead messianic view. And this was in fact God's way of bringing life and life in all of its fullness to Peter and whomsoever trusts him for it. But Peter couldn't see it. And so he rebukes Jesus. Again, it sounded like the right thing to say. It sounded like the thing a good friend would say. On the surface, 
completely honorable. His motivation is love, and he's just ignorant to the supreme plan of God. He doesn't want the Lord whom he loves to suffer and to die. So, and there's a sense that he's speaking for the whole group, as he so often did. He says, far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But then look at the blistering response of Jesus. Verse 23, he turned and he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. Kind of reads like a disproportionately harsh response, doesn't it? So how do we make sense of this? Get behind me, Satan. Well, come back with me to Matthew 4. Matthew 4. This is the account of the temptation of Jesus by Satan. And what you'll see here is that Jesus had been offered a kingdom without a cross before. Right at the tail end of Satan's attempts to tempt Jesus away from his messianic course, a course which would ultimately lead him to Jerusalem to suffer, to die, and then to rise. We read this in verse 8 of Matthew 4. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Be gone, Satan. Same kind of of language there, especially in the original. And I think that this goes a long way towards explaining both the sharpness of Jesus's counter rebuke and also Jesus addressing the counter rebuke to Satan, although it was Peter who had spoken to him. Jesus recognized the approach. He knew who it was who was ultimately behind these words of Peter. Satan, in this moment, was using Peter. Somehow, Satan had prompted Peter so that Peter was reasoning along Satan's lines and he was saying what Satan would have him say. Peter, in this moment, unwittingly had become an instrument of temptation and an enemy of the things of God. And this was a heavy temptation. This was the same form of of temptation that came to Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, which made him anxious to the point of sweating drops of blood. Satan was doing anything that he could to avert Jesus uh, from the cross, to get him to avoid the cross. Skip the suffering, Jesus. Have a kingdom without a cross. But Jesus was completely alert to the devil's schemes. And so he pivots and he says, get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me. To whom is he speaking? Does Jesus say this to Satan or does Jesus say this to Peter? The answer, yes, both. Because Peter had momentarily became as Satan eternally is, an enemy of God's mission. Now, here's the thing. How? By nailing Jesus to a cross? No, in fact, Quite the opposite, by trying to obstruct and hinder his path to the cross. Peter became a hindrance, not by holding a hammer, but by trying to hold the hammer back. So let's wrap this up, finishing where we started with the end of verse 23. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. From God's viewpoint, Jesus had to suffer and die. You see, from God's viewpoint, Jesus had to die. He had to go to Jerusalem precisely to be slain, to be the Passover lamb. From God's viewpoint, this had to happen. This was a divine must. But from the viewpoint of man, it was offensive, incomprehensible irreconcilable with the messianic view. And as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, men still see the cross as folly or as a stumbling block because our thoughts are still not his thoughts and our ways are still not his ways. What's the lesson for us? 
here's where we close. The Messiah may not fit your definitions or your preconceived notions, but he's still the only way to the Father. I love the way Eugene Peterson paraphrases Isaiah 53 verse 1b. Who would have thought God's saving power would look like this? It still perplexes people today. A common birth, a simple life, radical teaching, rejection, suffering, abandonment, then death. An excruciating public death. Who would have thought God's saving power would look like this? Well, God thought that his saving power would look like that. And his thoughts are higher and better than our thoughts. His ways are higher and better than our ways. And his thoughts and his way truly lead to abundant life. God bless you. We'll look forward to seeing you next week as we continue our journey towards Easter.